Part 2, Chapter 2, Rebirth I never thought a single room in the world could feel so hollow. Sat alone at an empty table with one empty chair directly across from me. I kept my back straight and hands folded over one another on my lap. The anguished separation painted on my face was two parts real and one part exaggerated for show. We arrived at the police station ten minutes ago and I have been alone in this room for an additional twenty. My mind stirring the chaos-infused calm, recounting each and every minute detail of the long, long day leading up to this moment. The demon was quiet now. After her suggestion to behead the three officers that showed up for the initial investigation, I made it a point to ignore her entirely, as best as I could. She wasn't too happy with that. Silence unraveled the emotional coils I sifted through, elaborated by the featureless white walls and ticking caged clock by the single door. I sat on the chair furthest from the door, facing it with a dreary anticipation, until finally a lady entered. She wasted no time. Hello, Miss Avery. I had to resubmit myself, adorn an expected posture and expression. Hi, I replied monotone. This woman looked to be in her late thirties, average height, dark brown hair pulled back in a bun. Her eyes were rounded and blue, tired but still maintaining the look of authority. She had a rounded jawline and a healthy figure. I didn't get any sort of hostile vibe from her, but kept my defenses raised. She sat at the opposite end of the table, spreading out some folders, loose papers, and two pens. My name is Eleanor Curlin. Are you okay to speak with me? She asked, politely yet firmly. I nodded. Great. Firstly, my condolences. I know you're exhausted and are dealing with this situation, but I need you to be strong for me and tell me what happened to the best of your ability. She spoke to me like I was a kid. I stared longer than I meant to, waiting for linear thoughts to form, but had a hard time reaching back. When I spoke up, every word came out careful and hushed. I went to my friend's house after school. I was there until the evening. And when I got back home, I found him. She scribbled on some paper. Okay. Do you remember anything out of the ordinary? Like what? I wearily stared. Well, the officers are still conducting an investigation, but there doesn't seem to be any sign of a break-in. When you got home, did anything stand out? Anything at all? Maybe hidden key missing, or the door left open? No. I don't think so. She scribbled something on her clipboard, and I shuffled my feet. I added, The house is always messy and unorganized, so it's hard to tell if something is misplaced or odd. I see. Now, Kimberly, these questions are going to be a little harder. Please take your time, and just know I'm here to help, all right? I didn't say anything, just lowered my head. She cleared her throat. Did your father have any enemies that you can think of? Her tone became more pleasant. (laughs) He was a pretty big jerk, with a long history of being a jackass in public. I'm sure some people didn't like him around here. She took a moment and read through some papers, familiarizing herself with documents based on my family and life. I twiddled my fingers, watching her slyly. Eventually, she stared back at me, now stern again. Do you know if he had any other habits, apart from the drinking? What, you mean like drugs or something? Her head tilted. Maybe. If he was even one foot in the trade and something went wrong, then he could have been targeted. Of course, these are all possibilities and assumptions. We aren't saying he was this person. We have to explore every avenue. I understand. As far as I know, he only took prescribed antidepressants that, on the best of days, didn't work very well. He wasn't very good at remembering when to take them and not mixing them with alcohol. I stated, slightly annoyed. She tapped a folder on the table with the butt of her pen. I folded my arms on the table in front of me, leaning my elbows for support while she scanned over her files and looked at me. I couldn't hide my exhaustion behind sad eyes. I think she could tell that I wasn't entirely devastated. Kimberly, I want to thank you for talking with me. I know this is hard for you. She started. 
I couldn't help but sigh loudly through my nose. Do you? I said just under my breath. Her eyebrow raised, face tight. All at once I felt my muscles bind. I chuckled quietly for a second or two, shaking my head in disbelief as the rot trench of despair filled. My dad was an abusive drunk. He didn't care about me or anything apart from that damn TV and booze. My throat ground the words to dust. Now he's dead. And I don't even know if I'm happy or sad that he's gone. How can you possibly sit here and tell me that you know how I feel when I don't even know? Out of nowhere, I felt like a thousand eyes were on me, watching and urging. I got anxious, paranoid, in a cynical sadness. I started to laugh in between cries. When I walked in and I saw him dead, you know what I felt? Happy. I felt happy because he couldn't hurt me anymore. I'm free, and I won't ever have to see that empty face again. But, I cried out. Sorrow and pity swelled behind her eyes, and she finished my sentence for me. But at the same time, he's your only family. Her words dragged. Kimberly, I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything by that. I'm just trying to say that I'm here to help you. I want to help. She was looking nervous. She doesn't understand you. The demon snarled. My eye twitched and I quickly sensed her tainted fingertips caress my temples. Let go. Claim her and everyone in this building to advance your power. You must trust me. My tongue lashed to the back of my teeth. Shh! I almost spoke out loud, shaking my head hard to one side. I jostled the stringent thought. Curlin's mumbling words hit the veil of my hearing and fumbled to the floor. Nothing more than numb whispers. My head lowered, and I fought against this beyond, and I fought against this burrowed surge, foot tapping the floor. Let it all go. Slithering syllables attempted to coerce. Kill her! The screech jolted my entire body, and Curlin went silent. Heavily panting through my nose, I raised my head and stared intently into her eyes, vision doubling and the taste of blood on my teeth. Are you with me? Curlin asked patiently. I glared, distant and pale. I nodded. She looked deeply into my face. Behind her own expression was a motherly tenderness, something delicately concealed that I resonated with. I couldn't stop shaking. She cleared her throat. I asked, is there anyone you can stay with for now? Any relatives in town? She repeated. No. It's just us here. I barely know the rest of my family. Hell, most of them are dead. I said shamefully. Are there any family friends? Guardians or anyone to contact? Because if you have nowhere to stay, then we will find a home for you while we continue our investigation. I believe waiting for another day to discuss might be the better course of action. Desperate, I ran a few faces through my mind. Um, I can ask my friends Tansu and Joey. Maybe one of them would take me in. I sniffled. Tansu and Joey. She scribbled the note on her clipboard. Yes, Tansu Hikono and her parents just moved here. And Joey Nelson has lived in this town since we were kids. But I know he isn't exactly in the best financial situation at home. Writhing guilt swept my system. The idea that the problems in my life can cause such a ripple in someone else's, changing the way they live or their perception of me. I don't have the right to invade their lives on such a personal level, but I don't know what other choices I have. I don't want to go to a home designated by the police. Miss Curlin bit her lip, thinking, All right, here's what I can do. For now, we can contact them both and see if either will take you in. Then we'll go from there. If they don't take you, we will arrange for you to stay with someone from the station until we find a home for you to settle in. The demon tempted me again, desperation in her static voice. Kimberly Ann, I know you want to feel it again. A shuddering breath slid down my throat. Stop it. I couldn't help but whisper. Hmm? Curlin vocalized. 
I shook my head. Nothing. Inner cackling deafened me briefly. She's playing. I need this lady to leave before I snap. Um, Miss Curlin, I asked. Yes? Before you make those calls, could I possibly have something to drink? I asked politely. She had a look of longing on her face, then a slight grin. No problem. We have soda in the break room. Would that be okay? Actually, water would be better. I kicked the soda habit some time ago. I chuckled awkwardly. Water it is, then. She smiled, then scribbled a final note on the clipboard and left the room in haste. Within ten seconds of her leaving, I felt a surge of manic energy shoot through me. In one swift motion, I bashed my own forehead against a solid table. When my skull reared back, it was full of laughter. All right, demon. Enough. I can't listen to your fucking voice anymore. Get used to it, she sang. Then her tone dipped to casual and monotone. You're stuck with me until your last breath, kid. Why work against me, then? Why not coexist? You're the one working against me. This isn't your life anymore. It's our shared trial. This is my body. My feet pressed firmly to the floor, and the red spot on my forehead rested on my palm. I tried to imagine her appearance and assign a face to the voice, but it was difficult. It's like she was purposely avoiding the searchlight of my thoughts. I'm not scared of you. You're nothing but an abomination. Her energy shifted, sizzling now. Careful, Kim. You really don't want to be on my bad side. Right then, Miss Curlin returned with a glass in her hand. She didn't say anything upon entering, just handed me the glass and took her seat. It was quiet. Between sips, I set the glass on the table, pretending it was an act of good manners to not chug the water. In reality, I had to put on the facade that drinking from this glass wasn't such a challenge. Nausea returned with the chilled liquid filling in my empty stomach. The longer I sat there, the more my limbs started to relax. My neck became stiff, and my eyelids began to close. I struggled to stay awake, but I felt mixed up inside, something I can't exactly explain. The room went dark. At least, it did for me. Passed out, right there in the seat, for who knows how long. There were dancing colors, consisting only of tones and hues on the red spectrum. They moved like gnats in swirling air, imitating people and voices. Every faint noise tickled my bones and folded me gently inside out. In the distance were mountains decorated by massive wind chimes, frozen in place and yearning to call across the land. The clouds were shattered glass, and one in particular housed an empty slot where I knew a piece to have been stolen. I had no body but beneath my perception was unearthed soil that I knew to be poisoned. A deep part of me wanted to consume the earth, line the gaps of my teeth with maggots and encroaching cold. Laughter, playful and sinister, taunting. The shadow to my spectral nothingness wavered, persistently chortling in reverse. All at once, I experienced a tearing throughout my mind, and everything peeled away like ashes and water replaced by white and a physical sensation. A warm touch shook me awake, forcing my eyes to shoot open violently. With this sudden burst of energy, I let out a frightened gasp and lashed my arms out in defense. By doing so, I knocked the glass off the table and sent water all over the place. Hey, hey, it's okay. It's just me. Miss Curlin put her hands up flat, showing that she wasn't a threat. Panic was blaring in my ears, because at first I didn't recognize her, or this place. I was mentally continuing from this morning, thinking immediately that I was late for school. But soon, these sirens calmed down, and I remembered where I was. Dazed, depression sinking in, I asked. I'm sorry, did I fall asleep? You were out almost an hour and a half, she smiled invitingly. I have good news. Everything checked out. I spoke with your friend's mother and explained the situation. 
The Hikonos agreed to take you in tonight. She tried to sound cheerful, but I could see in my bloodshot eyes that she was tired too. Tonsu's mom said it was okay for me to stay there? Are we waiting till morning to go? No, we're going there now, if you're ready. I looked around the room and saw the glass of water spilled on the floor. Luckily, the glass didn't break. That thing was damn heavy, so it must be pretty dense. She saw that I was fixated on it. Don't worry about that. It's just water. I'm sorry. I frowned. It's not a big deal, Kimberly. She smiled. Her radio suddenly buzzed, and she paused to listen. She turned the small knob on the top to lower the volume down to a whisper. Well... She clapped her hands with false enthusiasm. Ready when you are. On the move, I followed her back down those long, crooked hallways. The blinding lights assaulted my eyes and cast a black shadow wherever I went. I could almost feel their warming heat on my body and head as we moved slowly beneath them. My skin felt dirty in this light, corrupted and split. I didn't want to be in this place any longer. Departing the station an arm's length apart, we were met by the misty sheet of rain descending from the pale gray sky above. We rushed through the gentle trickle and climbed into the cruiser. Surprisingly, I was relieved to be back in here, this time without the sirens. Relieved, but somehow less comfortable. The drive to their house felt longer than it should have. The pitter-patter of the raindrops hit the moving cruiser with refrained aggression. I attempted to stare out the side window, focused on something other than the pounding of my swollen brain anticipating sleep. But I was far from the dreams, farther now than ever before. A departure from normality. I was afraid. My attention was drawn to the little droplets of rain running down the back seat window, and I wondered. If rain were alive, how would it feel? Would it feel sad that its life started off falling from the sky, falling at high speeds with no concept of what they were speeding towards? Its brothers and sisters simultaneously crashed down to an undeserving world, every destination unknown, unfathomable to something so small and insignificant. Whether it be absorbed into the dirt, a larger pool of water, or anywhere else, it didn't have any choice. It falls, destined to be mixed and mashed together in a sea of long-lost cousins and siblings. An endless cycle. Perhaps we are one and the same living our lives day by day, thinking that we have meaning. Yet, one way or another, we all end up in the ground, mixed and crushed and turned to dust, recycled. Just like every person before and after us, everyone whose lives were affected by our existence will end up just the same. I could feel it, as the street signs turned to trees, the sleep tried to drag me under again. A thin line of consciousness warbled beneath my feet like a tightrope. Drawing nearer to my destination, I considered what Tonsu's reaction may be. Will they accept me as I am, broken and orphaned? Will they cast me aside the moment the opportunity arises? Or will they take me in and glue my pieces back together? The idea pressed a knot against the walls of my stomach. Then, I considered something morbid. The last she saw me, I had just spilled my guts about my dad's abuse and the research into the supernatural had intensified. I wonder if she will assemble the puzzle and come to a nasty conclusion. There's no way, I thought. Not a moment later, we turned into the driveway, and my nerves were pulled tight once more. I don't know how much more of this anxiety I can bear for the night, but I have no choice. The driveway light was on, a lighthouse in the stormy night. As the cruiser eased to a halt and the taillights blasted the house on the other side of the street, the front door opened wide. I moved the bag from my lap and set it on the seat beside me, turning my eyes away from their home, groggily moving about. I forced the door open and set one foot on the ground. However, before I could even fully turn to step out, I was instantly greeted by rushed footsteps in a powerful hug. My heavy body leaned on hers as her tight arms embraced me. She was crying softly, unable to speak right away. My arms closed around her as I looked toward the house to see her mom stepping out from the front door with an umbrella raised. Oh my god, Kimmy, are you, are you okay? She whimpered. My voice was dry, churning from exhaustion. I stated, 
I... I'm... I couldn't say it. I pulled myself back, but kept both hands gently laced on her shoulders. She did as well. I could see her face in the light within the vehicle. Small details washed away by the pale yellow glow. Her eyes were wide. Errant sincerity beckoned my hollow gaze. Seeing her cry, seeing her face red and distraught by this, triggered some rusted emotion at my core. What happened? She asked softly. I struggled to find a word or phrase to convey my thoughts. My tongue became taut, refusing to give any indication as to the events that unfolded. Miss Curlin had exited the vehicle to meet with Kari. They both took turns glancing in my direction, swapping whatever information was needed. Tansu and I waited here in perpetual silence. For once, she was the one prodding me for a response, and I was hesitant. But we didn't have to wait here long. In a short time, Miss Curlin and Kari returned to the car on our side. Okay, girls. Everything's all set. You can go on inside. Curlin stated. I took a good look at her mom through the refracting glass and lifting rain. It was clear by the droop in her face that she was distressed. We all were. In overwhelming sadness, pity, and regret over something she had no control over, I gave a final wave to Curlin from the door as she backed out and eased away into the night. I gave a sigh of relief through my nose and closed the door. Everything was moving quickly, each second a fraction of itself and almost feeling fast-forwarded. With the door shut and thick silence lingering, I spent a considerable amount of time just facing the door, unmoving, quiet. I could feel them behind me, watching as my shoulders rose and sank with every tired breath. For a moment, my eyes closed and I felt like I was floating. Then, my eyes opened and it felt like a dark veil had been lifted off my body. I turned to them, cheeks red and eyes dark, peering. They returned my stare with concern. Wearily making my way to the living room, they each followed and joined me on the couch. I was ready to tell them what happened. At first, they were quiet, just listening to me recall the same lie I told the police. I tried to keep my eyes low so they wouldn't see the lack of emotion I had, but I had to connect with them, at least once or twice, and when I did, it only made me feel that much more worse. Kari especially had this dreadfully pale stare. I know she felt awful, aware that only just hours ago, she had dropped me off not knowing exactly what I would be walking in on, though that was her fiction to live. Tansu was red in the face, tears resting at the edge of her lids and only seeping through at the end. For her, this seemed to resonate. She felt my pain in the way I conveyed it on a deeply personal level, whether it was empathy or something more. Either way, the two of them shed more tears than I did by the time we reached the end of this transitory circumstance. It was 2.30 a.m. now, and neither my body nor mine could stay awake any longer. It was obvious to them that I needed rest, so Kari stepped away to retrieve spare blankets and a pillow. Tansu stayed beside me, watching my head dip forward as I fought for consciousness. When she returned, I took it with gratitude and propped it against the arm of the couch. Tansu slid off the couch and gave me room to lie down, choosing to sit on the floor while I got comfortable. Kari said goodnight and assured me that things will be all right before heading to her bedroom, leaving just the two of us. My back throbbed as I flattened out and stared up at the ceiling. It was strange to see a different ceiling, a different peripheral, but in a way, I liked it. It was new. Kim? Tansu whispered. Yeah. I kept my eyes directed up at the ceiling. She then reached out and placed her hand on my left shoulder. I twitched. I'm here. You know that, right? I know. She paused, letting the stillness fester before she abruptly stood up. Hold on. She ushered quietly. She then dashed through the dark into her room and came back out seconds later with her blanket and a pillow. What are you doing? I asked. She pushed the coffee table to the side with her feet and then plopped the stuff onto the carpet in front of the couch. You're not sleeping out here alone. Don't be foolish, I said in a low voice. Sleep in your bed. I'll be fine. Nope, you didn't convince me. She smiled and sat down on the floor, spreading out the blanket. I sighed, 
lacking the strength or willpower to argue at this point. She nestled herself close to the base of the couch and wrapped her body tight in the blanket, a little cocoon for the night. The room felt warm to me, a little stuffy under the blankets, and way more expansive than my bedroom. My vision started to get swimmy, and every joint or muscle between my diaphragm and my little toe thumped like a piston. Yet, on the outside, I was inexplicably stable. Calm. Hey. I pushed a whisper. Hmm? She grunted, barely audible. Thank you. Really. The response I got was a soft snoring. She was out. I smirked, feeling a new warmth in my chest. Closing my eyes, I let the images of my imagination run wild. Surprisingly, I could sense the demon's presence, but she was lax. There were no voices, no scratching, and no fear. <laughs>